And welcome everybody to this morning's session of Marxism, the opening session of Saturday. Um, we've got a brilliant meeting to start off with um, in defence of party building. John Molyneux is our speaker. John is the editor of the Irish Marxist Review, which we'd really encourage you to get a copy of at the end. And also has an article in the current International Socialism Journal on the very topic in defence of party building. And John's been an author on so many different topics, Marxism, Leninism, building the party, probably one of the most... In fact, there's not many topics I don't think John's probably written on. So really looking forward. He's going to speak for about 35 minutes, and after that, we have plenty of time for people to join in the discussion. So over to you, John. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Um, right. Uh, right, comrades. Um, this, this meeting will have four elements to it. Uh, on the topic of party building. The first is uh, a relatively timeless argument uh, about uh, the necessity of a revolutionary party for socialist revolution, for working class victory. Uh, the second is the specific context for discussing this now and this debate at the moment, which is the um, dissolution of the International Socialist Organization in America had happened earlier this year, and the debate about party building that followed on from that, particularly focused around an article uh, uh, by the Canadian socialist David McNally, um, uh, and also other people, Hal Draper, and so on. These were articles written a while ago, but they, uh, they, they were arguments against party building that were then taken up on the American left in response to the uh, collapse of the ISO. Uh, thirdly, I'm going to address some of the elements of, uh, some of the problems involved in party building, um, uh, some of the difficulties that accompany it, because it isn't a simple or easy process. And fourthly, I'm going to return to the situation, the political uh, and social situation that we face today uh, 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 at the end, and again, make the case of why I think party building is important right now. Okay. Uh, I want to start with a very simple fact, uh, an elemental fact about modern politics that was stated by Antonio Gramsci, the great Italian revolutionary socialist and Marxist. And that is that if you're serious about politics in the modern world, you need a party. He put it this way. He said, uh, the modern prince, by which he meant that if, if people are not aware, that the prince was the great figure um, from Machiavelli's famous book from the Renaissance. The prince was going to be the actor who would create a united Italy and so on. <laughs> Gramsci, writing in prison, in a situation where he has to use uh, somewhat elliptical language, says the modern prince, by which he, he, he means the modern revolutionary leadership, cannot be an individual, it has to be a party, a political party. And actually, that's true if you're serious even about electoral politics, never mind revolutionary politics, that you need a, poli uh, a, a political party. Um, now, there's two kinds of arguments, I think, for the necessity of, of a revolutionary party. This is that, that have always been there, that we uh, in the international socialist tradition have relentlessly argued, certainly since the late 60s. Um, the first is historical, the historical experience. The fact is that there have been, since the Paris Commune, innumerable attempts at workers' revolution. You know, Russia 1905, the German Revolution, the Italian Red Years, uh, the uh, Chinese Revolution 1925 to 27, the Spanish Revolution at the beginning of the, uh, the, the Civil War, France, 1968, Hungary, 1956, Portugal, 1974, it, you know, all the way through to Egypt in 2011 and so on. Innumerable attempts. We have had one sustained victory. That was the Russian Revolution of uh, October 1917. Sustained victory as in the sense of at least the working class was able to, to uh, take and hold state power for a period of years. We know they lost it and there was the Stalinist counter-revolution and so on. But it was a sustained victory across a nation, not just in one city like the Paris Commune and so on, for a number of years. Only one victory in all that, in all that time. And that 
the distinguishing feature of that was the existence of a revolutionary party that had been built in the years running up to the revolution, had established a, a, a critical mass so that it could intervene in the revolution, uh, and had established deep roots in the working class and was trusted and had the loyalty of a key section of the Russian working class, the Bolshevik party of Lenin. That was the key factor. And when you look through the experience, I can't do this today, but we have done it uh, in our tradition for almost all those other revolutionary events that I spoke about. When you look through those revolutionary events, you can see how the absence of such a, a, a party uh, is a key factor in their, in their defeat. So there's that historical experience. There's secondly, there's a, a theoretical argument. Right? And I will summarize it very, very briefly. One can write a great deal on this. Um, I have done it various times, but one can start. I will summarize it very briefly here. Um, we need a revolutionary party for revolutionary victory because we face a highly centralized enemy. The ruling class is centralized, first of all, through its state, but it's also centralized economically. Even a giant multinational corporation is highly centralized. Its managers toe the same line. Uh, uh, and it has a state apparatus that is able to act in a coordinated fashion against the working class. If we are going to defeat the, uh, uh, this enemy, we need centralized organization. We need to be able to coordinate uh, what happens in Newcastle, what happens in Glasgow, what happens uh, in, in Liverpool uh, uh, and London, or uh, Dublin and Belfast and Derry in the Irish context. We need to be able to... We, it, it, well, yes, but uh, at least for a national revolution, one needs to be able to uh, uh, coordinate. If we can coordinate Mumbai as well, that will be wonderful. <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, it, it, you need to, to be able to act in unison, or any kind of attempt at revolutionary insurrection will be, will be destroyed. Um, now, then, face the fact that as Marx put it, the ruling ideas are, in any period are the ideas of the ruling class. And that these, in normal times, dominate the thinking of most working class people. And therefore, the rise or the development of working class consciousness is always an uneven process. Uh, right? As is the development of working class confidence and the development of working class organization and struggle. Uh, Consequently, you, there needs to be a fight for socialist ideas and revolutionary ideas within the working class and also for uh, revolutionary uh, and socialist tactics uh, and strategy within the working class movement. And to do that, there needs to be an organization which draws together the advanced, the fighting elements of the class and enables them to develop an independent strategy uh, and fight for revolutionary leadership within, within the class. Uh, and thirdly, if that does not uh, happen, if that is not achieved, then the revolution will actually be led by reformists. There won't be a vacuum. You will not, the idea that you will have a, uh, a simply a purely spontaneous revolution uh, in which there are no leaders, the anarchist dream is unfortunately a dream. It's a fantasy. It does not happen. What happens is that if there is not revolutionary leadership, there uh, is reformist leadership, and we have come, takes us back to the historical experience. The historical experience is that reformist leaderships, at the worst, completely sell out and destroy the revolution, and at the very best, lead, fail to lead it to, to victory. Even when they have the best of intentions, they do not have the ideas or the organization or the will to lead the revolution to victory. And the defeat of revolutions in such circumstances is paid for in blood by the working class. So that, that's the case for the necessity of uh, a, a revolutionary party. And you might think uh, that if people who accepted that case would simply say, well, that is what has to be done. Uh, difficult as it may be, that is what has to be done. But, and this is where the specific context of what happened in America um, uh, comes up because um, the International Socialist Organization that used to be a sister organization of the 
Socialist Workers' Party voted earlier this year to dissolve itself. We, we had been separated since the period of the uh, anti cap since the period of Seattle and the anti capitalist revolt. We were not um, in, in, in fraternal relations at, the, at this point. But the fact is that they were people who, everything that I've set up to now, I think they would have accepted it. They certainly would have argued it. They came from a tradition uh, which would have quoted all the, the, those uh, uh, arguments. But they decided to abandon part the project of building a revolutionary party. Now, I don't want to go, I don't, this is not a, uh, certainly not an exercise in bashing the ISO and certainly not an exercise in picking over the bones of this. People can talk about it if they want. But what's important in this is that in the aftermath of that decision, and as part of that decision, um, an, uh, an article by David McNally, also from our tradition way back, uh, called uh, uh, The Period, The Party, and The Next Left, gained a lot of currency. And it's clear that this argument had a big appeal to people who wanted to give up on the idea of party building. Uh, and, I want, and I want to say something about, uh, 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 therefore, about that. Um, this, this article argued um, I, uh, that the whole process of trying to build a small or relatively small group into a revolutionary party should be abandoned. One, it's too difficult. It never succeeds. It never has succeeded. This was part of, uh, part of, the, uh, of the argument. That's not how parties develop, from a small group growing incrementally into a, into a serious party. And secondly, not only does it not succeed, but that it almost inevitably becomes mired in what uh, could be called a sect mentality a closed sect cut off from the living struggle, obsessed with it, 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 its own routines and procedures and unable to relate uh, uh, to, to the wider movement. Now, um, I will quote here what, what McNally says. Uh, I'll quote him at a bit of length because it's important to see the nature of his argument. I think it's an important argument. As I see it, the necessity of a new left for a new era forces all of us to confront and break with the legacy of the micro-party approach. At its heart, the micro-party perspective consists in believing that a small revolutionary group is, in essence, the same thing as constructing a revolutionary party. Fundamentally, then, this perspective involves a simple syllogism. One, there can be no socialist revolution without an authentically revolutionary party. What I've just argued. Two, our group is the, is the custodian of the authentic revolutionary tradition. Three, therefore, there can be no socialist revolution without our group, i.e. building our organization is the key to constructing a mass revolutionary party. Rather than address the really crucial questions, that is, how is the left to rebuild practices, organizations, and cultures of working class self-mobilization so that a working class vanguard might actually be recreated and a meaningful party built in its ranks? Real social historical problems get reduced to questions of building the small group, recruiting more members, selling more papers, creating new, new branches. That, that, that is the core uh, of his argument. Now, if I'm absolutely honest here, I can see how that has an appeal to people. Um, I've been doing some of that routines for nigh on 50 years. Somebody comes along and says, you don't need to do it anymore. I understand, I understand uh, why that, that might ha uh, have, an, uh, have an appeal. But I actually fundamentally disagree with the argument that Manali is putting forward here. First point, he says it's a syllogism. It isn't. There are a series of propositions. They don't follow logically one from another. One, if we accept the necessity of a revolutionary party, and I think McNally does in some abstract way, right, it does not follow from that, that the group that you're trying to build is the exclusive custodian of the revolutionary tradition. I don't think any of us should claim that. I don't think any organization that we're trying to build should claim to be the, cust 
custodian of the authentic revolutionary tradition. Of course, we aim to be authentic revolutionaries. Of course, we try to. Be. But the authentic revolutionary tradition is a broad thing that can stretches in one sense back to Spartacus, in another sense back to Marx and Lenin, and has many elements to it, and is continually developing now and being renewed. So it also includes what happened at Stonewall. It also includes Black Lives Matter. It also includes Extinction Rebellion and, uh, and so on. We are not custodians of something that you can bottle and hold. So that's a, a wrong understanding of what I think any of us should uh, uh, claim uh, to be. And the third proposition, therefore, therefore, there can be no so a socialist revolution without our group, i.e. building our organization is the key to constructing a mass revolutionary party. It doesn't follow either. We hope to contribute to this process. It is necessary to do, to build for this process, but the idea that there is some, it follows that therefore, you know, we have a monopoly on this and that uh, if we fail, for example, therefore, then the revolution, whole revolutions fail. I don't accept that and I don't think any of us be, uh, believes that. Uh, it would mean that if you believed the ISO was the custodian of the revolution in America, that the, its failure would then mean there could never be a revolution. No organizations rise. The first international rose, it fell. The second international rose, it fell. The third international rose to a height not, not seen before that, and it fell. The fourth international rose, and it didn't so much fall as splinter into a million fragments. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean, follow that any of us should believe that that's the end of the story. That's nonsense. Neither, and this is most important, does it mean that we believe, because we believe in party building, that the building the party, it just consists of recruiting by ones and twos uh, from where we are so that we are 4,000, then we go to 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, and by the time the world has ended, which is, oh, you know, we've reached 100,000 or whatever. That doesn't mean that at all. Uh, uh, and uh, David McNally is quite wrong to suggest that that was ever the perspective of our tradition. Um, uh, I was a member of uh, the uh, IS and the SWP in Britain from um, uh, 1968 through uh, to 2010 when I moved to Ireland. Just reviewing some of that uh, history, you could, you'll see what I mean. In 1968, which is when we first really started to move from being a, a, a kind of propaganda group and discussion group to party building, one of the things we did on the initiative of Tony Cliff uh, was put out a call for unity of the left on four basic points. Didn't get taken up, but the particular hope of that was that we would be able to unite with the international Marxist group, then particularly identified with Tariq Ali, the fourth international, because we thought that in the uh, exciting atmosphere of revolt of 1968, that if a unified revolutionary organization would emerge, it would recruit, it would attract thousands of people around it. So we took an in initiative not to grow by ones and twos, but hopefully to create a much bigger pool within which we could fight for revolutionary politics. In the early 70s, we worked at, out of the rising industrial struggle, we worked to build rank and file groups in the trade unions and to build a national rank and file organization uh, 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 around that. We also, in the middle and late 70s, we worked through mass campaigns like the Anti-Nazi League. Uh, uh, and to a lesser extent, the right to work campaign, and so, uh, 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 and so on. The perspective that McNally says is what well, the essential one of you huddle together and recruit by just you know a routine of party branch meetings, paper sales, and recruiting by ones and twos only really came in uh, in the period of the downturn, uh, as it was known, uh, of, uh, following or I'm having to summarize complex history here, but following the social contract with the Labour government and the assault of Thatcher on the trade unions and the defeat of that rising working class movement in, uh, in that period. We faced a pressure from many different directions, one of which obviously was the Tory party and the assault and the collapse of shop stewards organization and so on. That meant the rank and file strategy couldn't be applied. And we face also a political pressure from the 
from the Labour Party and the rise of Benite reformism and so on. And in that situation, we had, the party had to hold together and it adopted that kind of perspective. The heavy emphasis on political education, heavy emphasis uh, on individual recruitment, and the slogan was, oh, we'll recruit by ones, uh, ones and twos. But it didn't stay that way. That then changed uh, late, later uh, as the, the, the struggle revived, major activities through the uh, anti-poll tax uh, uh, struggle. We did, a, later in the 90s, we did an electoral perspective through the Socialist Alliance, uh, 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 and then Respect growing out of the mass campaigning with the Stop the War Coalition and so on. There were many different phases to this. If I add to this the um, Irish experience, uh, in Ireland we have operated for a number of years now with the core revolutionary party, the Socialist Workers Party, then Socialist Workers Network, operating within the envelope of the People Before Profit Alliance, which was founded originally out of local campaigns in 2005 and has grown to be a, a, a quite considerable national organization capable of making um, substantial uh, national interventions, both electorally and, uh, and in struggle. So, uh, the, you know, it's ended up with uh, um, three TDs in the South, uh, one uh, MLA were two for a while in, in the north, a number of councillors, but also capable of making major interventions in things like the anti-water charges movement and the uh, uh, repeal referendum and so on, playing a leading role in, in those struggles. And people before profit is, it, it's, it's not a reformist organisation, but it's also not a fully a revolutionary party. It's a space where by and large, under the leadership of revolutionaries, we work with people who are not yet revolutionaries, who are on the road to being revolutionaries, rather than hard, hard road. So it's an innovation, it's something different. But what I'm trying to say here is that the perspective of, of party building involves all sorts of different things. You look at the older history of the, uh, 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 of the movie, You'll, you can see this in terms of the Leninist and Trotskyist tradition, for example. The German Communist Party, uh, became a mass party at one congress, the congress, HAL Congress, at which Zinoviev, representing the Bolsheviks, made a enormous, I mean, this is a sort of shortened version of what happened, it was a long proper action, but made an enormous speech and recruited half the independent or more of the independent socialist German uh, Socialist Party to join the Communist Party. So they, they grew massively, all sorts of different forms of, uh, of development. So that, that syllogism is, is fundamentally wrong. Now, uh, it's also wrong that small groups cannot become uh, mass parties. The Bolsheviks started as an extremely small group. They started as the Emancipation of Labour Group in 1893 that probably had about 30 members. Right? And it grew through various stages to ending up to the point where it was 26,000 or so in the beginning of 1917, through, ver through a whole give or take. Through a whole, and then in 1917 could grow from being about 26,000 to being two or 300,000 by October. So it's not true that you can't do it. And a whole number of the parties of the Communist International started as small groups before there existed a mass working class vanguard and so on, but succeeded in becoming, through various means, mass parties. So that's not true that it, 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 it cannot be done. Now, um, there's a question then, of course, not just what is the uh, uh, argument uh, that you try and knock down, there's also a question of what is your alternative. And here it's quite interesting to look what uh, um, David McNally puts forward as his alternative. He says, first of all, the first alternative is what he calls fostering practices. That is, developing forms of struggle and institutions which assist the formation of a class vanguard. That's put in fairly flowery terms, but what I think it means is that you are a militant activist in your area, your community, your workplace, your trade union, and so on. Um, you work to develop you know, good shop floor organization, good district organization, struggles in, in your locality of various kinds. We all, 
nose. Now, I just simply say to, to this, this is not an alternative. We should all be doing this. Every revolutionary should be doing this uh, as far as they possibly can. That should be the, uh, the bread and butter work of, of all of us. Right? The question is whether you do it as an isolated individual or whether you do it as part of a coordinated group, and uh, i.e. a party. And I think if you do it in the the latter way, A, you do it more effectively, and B, you're likely to do it in a more sustained way. You just do it as individuals, I think it just tends to wither. Uh, it's not very effective, and it just withers. You, you, know, you stop doing it after six weeks, or you stop doing it after six months, or whatever. It's through doing it collectively as part of a party that that is done most uh, effectively. He says also that uh, regroupment is a, a strategy. And um, he doesn't mean by that, by the way, the regroupment of small Trotskyist groups. Okay. Um, oh dear, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes, I always, I always do this. Right, but he, he means that we should regroup uh, uh, the modern equivalents, he says, of things like drum and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and rank and file movements and so on, into forming a party, uh, 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 a party formation and so on. But if you're not party building, how do you do that? I don't see how, uh, how you do that. And the last point he makes is uh, uh, he says that we need uh, international, we need conferences uh, that, that uh, um, sponsored by a variety of serious left publications which can bring together hundreds of people from different radical and revolutionary backgrounds to engage in discussions and debates and so on. Uh, a bit like Marxism, I suspect, although that's probably not what he has in mind. More, I imagine he has in mind like historical materialism conferences, uh, in which I'm sure he engages a good deal. Um, but my point about that is, good such conferences may be, but if they are not linked to a project of building a party, then I don't see how they're going to lead to it. Anybody who's ever been to a historical materialism conference would know what I'm talking about. There. They're very easy for the David, for intellectuals, the David McNally's of the world, to tour around the world visiting, but they don't result in any kind of serious political organization. So effectively, his alternative, I suggest, actually is nothing. That uh, um, nothing happens. Now, I'm going to have to speed up, I realize. One thing, however, he's right about, uh, and that is that there, the process of trying to build a small group into a party is a very difficult one, fraught with problems, and is not a simple matter. Now, he, I think, massively underestimates what is the real fundamental problem here, which, which is the problem of reformism. And uh, uh, um, the, one of the key characteristics of the Bolshevik party and of the kind of parties, of any parties, a genuinely revolutionary party, is that it does not have a reformist wing. I don't mean it purges every individual. I mean it does not have an organized reformist wing within itself. That was what distinguished the Bolshevik party. One of the things that distinguished the Bolshevik party from the other parties of the, uh, uh, of the Second International. Uh, right. But when you don't have that, Look what happens. Look, for example, at what has happened to momentum recently. Uh, right. It, it's not that there is no, you know, the enormous enthusiasm that accompanied momentum at, at the beginning. How much, it, it, how good it looked. All the Corbynistas and so on, in or out of momentum in the Labour Party. But reformism really, dis, uh, uh, you know, uh, dis, dis, destroys um, that. So, he completely underestimates the problem of the pressure of reformism, uh, which is a constant problem for us, and one of the constant reasons why you need a revolutionary party. Uh, but there is also, what he emphasizes, the sect danger, the danger of degenerating to a sect. And I think that's a real one. I think that uh, the very problem is of building a small party in opposition to... Uh, the whole of the existing society and holding people together uh, around a set of ideas that are uh, receive no support in the, you know, the dominant culture 
uh, uh, etc., creates the danger of people huddling together in a, uh, 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 in a sect. And I think that what's particularly dangerous about this is it can creep up on you without you knowing it. Um, you know, the, internet, the ISO, the International Socialist Organization of America, had read and, uh, uh, and swore by all the key texts on this question, Lenin's left-wing communism, for, uh, 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 for example. That, you know, they would, have, they would have studied it in their educationals. You can have all the key positions. Another example I would give of that would be um, the Socialist Party in, uh, in England, the CWR, Committee for a Workers International. Internationally. They all, you know, they'd read Lenin, they knew, they said they weren't sectarian, etc. But in practice, what they developed into an organization completely incapable of working with other people barely willing to talk to other people. I mean, I, I mean, we have them, they're quite a significant force in Ireland and we have an alliance with, we're in an alliance with them, they still won't talk to you. <laughs> it's extraordinary. They're not all like that, but it's a, the people, anybody who knows them knows them will know, know, will know that, 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 that it, there is that tendency exists uh, among them. And they can't work with, with people. So it, can, it comes upon you without you, you realizing uh, and so on. You get into a situation where you just get used to talking to each other and you just get used to your routine and you can't relate. Okay. Now, um, what then is the antidote to this? I think the antidote to this, and I think it was just as central to Leninism and the Bolshevik party as the question of, not, of breaking with reformism, not having a reformist wing. That is that you struggle continuously to relate to the working class and to the movement. The antidote to the, the, the sectarian danger and the reformist pull is that you have a living, organic relationship with the, the, with the working class. And sometimes with sections of the middle classes and so on uh, 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 as well. Um, the, that disciplines the organization I'm quoting from memory, actually, Lenin insists on this, that the discipline of the organization comes from this. It disciplines the organization, it disciplines the leadership, it works against our cult of leadership, because ordinary working class people won't tolerate it. It puts a discipline on the members, how they behave, and it means you have, you're forced to learn how to speak, interact with, and talk to ordinary people uh, 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 at the same time. And so that, that is the principle, I would say, uh, antidote to that problem of the sectarian uh, uh, danger. Now, come back to the um, situation today. The obvious thing, and uh, I feel like a broken record at the moment, because uh, it's the thing I say, I, uh, you know, say in every conversation I have with every taxi driver and every meeting, it's the same point. The situation is extremely urgent. We are looking at an ecological crisis that will create either the conditions for revolution or the conditions for fascist barbarism uh, in the coming years. The 12 years to the end of the world is not the right thing, but it's, it's a decade, the coming decade, in which there will be an immense intensification and polarization, an immense intensification of a massive social crisis. Unless the scientists are completely wrong, that is inevitable. Uh, and I'm very, very cautious about saying anything is inevitable. That is inevitable. So the situation is exceedingly urgent. And you can make this very, very concrete in terms of what it will mean to have even the embryo of a revolutionary party or not. Look at the situation in Sudan at the moment. Would the situation in Sudan be better or worse if there was an organization in Sudan like the revolutionary socialists that existed in Egypt? Would the revolution in Egypt have had a better chance of succeeding if the revolutionary socialists, instead of being a small group, had been an organization of 10 or 20,000 with roots in the Egyptian working class? Would it be better in the Sudan today or in Algeria today if there was a serious organization with roots in the Sudanese working class that was not only arguing for strike action, but also arguing for the perspective 
of permanent revolution. They wouldn't have to call it permanent revolution because I'm sure the Sudanese masses have never heard of that. But would, would be arguing, in other words, we don't just stop at a deal with the military. We don't just stop at some sort of promise of civilian rule. We want to fight to develop and fight for the interests of the working class and develop organizations of workers' power because we're looking beyond just bourgeois democracy. Which would be better? Which would offer the better chance of success? Because we're going to see repeats of those situations. We're going to see situations in which you are having millions of refugees being created by climate change, and you either solve that pro uh, problem on the basis of fascism or you solve it on the basis of socialist revolution. So I think when you look at the situation in the world today, being just an independent leftist, touring the conferences and contributing to practices as you go along in a, in a vague sort of way is not good enough. It is a crucial historical task that we do everything that we can to build uh, uh, revolutionary organizations. Yes, in, uh, uh, in Britain and in Ireland and in India <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and every, everywhere else that, that, uh, that we possibly can because Quite simply, I think that uh, the future, literally, the future of humanity and the coming generations depends on it. <laughs>Uh, so, um, yeah, and uh, the recruitment is really um, uh, important because we need to have uh, a lot of numbers. And uh, here we are recruiting people because they are uh, th uh, they have sympathy with them, uh, with us uh, because they enjoy the meeting, they enjoy what we are doing. But um, being a revolutionary communist is a bit, uh, yeah, uh, goes further than that. Is understand the importance of the emancipation of the work class. It's to uh, understand the materialism, the dialectic, and uh, so on. So uh, my question is, um, how uh, can we uh, uh, make sure that everyone in the party is uh, became a formed communist, uh, able to uh, yeah to have an important role during a revolution? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, the mic's going to go over to, over that way. Thank you. Um, just to say, obviously, it's great for people to make contributions, but again, if stuff come up in your discussion, you just wanted to ask a question, please do that as well. Feel free to do that. So, yeah. Um, after this um, lady here, I've got a, a young uh, guy here in the red, red shirt here. Thanks. Hi. Um, I'm not uh, quite as long a member of the International Socialists and SWP as, as John, shortly behind him. <laughs> and I just want to say that actually in the course of my lifetime as a revolutionary socialist in... Uh, we've made all the mistakes. I mean, we kind of liquidated ourselves pretty well during the question during the anti-Nazi. We didn't do enough kind of recruiting people at uh, at at the time, and we kind of pulled ourselves together again after that. But lots of us will remember during the period of uh, of respect, um, actually, party organisation again kind of uh, almost uh, almost disappeared. So this idea that there was some kind of monolithic same way of doing things like John has said is actually just um, a complete distortion of, 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 uh, of our history and equally 
uh, I think all of us who've, who've been around know that we've actually had to battle against the question of, of being, being a sect. But the antidote to that is engagement with movements in the, in, in, in the real world. There is no substitute for it. If nothing is happening, then there is no way in which you can have the real dynamism of life on which the, the lifeblood of democracy depends in a, in a revolutionary organization. But the other thing, I just want to say one other thing, and that is that I am very concerned uh, that with the Dave McNally kind of analysis is that it throws out any notion of revolutionary tradition. Well, there are some key principles, it seems to me, which are very, very important for us. And that, that, the key one I remember absorbing and, you know, maintained to this, di uh, this day is Marx's formulation that the emancipation of the working class is the act of the working class. And that, and that is absolutely central in terms, of, um, in, in, in terms of the difference with reformism. But it's also central in the way that Rosa Luxemburg developed it, that actually where the power lies is where, you know, where the chains are forged, there they have to be broken. And actually the organized working class, organized, the working class organizing itself at the point of production is absolutely central to, uh, to, to, to that process. And I'm worried that actually part of the dissolution of the notion of building a revolutionary organization goes hand in hand with rejecting those, not being clear about those, those sorts of principles or they're being lip service paid to them, but in reality, actually not starting from them. Thank you. Um, after this comrade here, there'll be a comrade here. All right. Uh... Well, thanks, uh, John. That was a fantastic talk. Um, and obviously agree with the entire substance of it. And I think, you know, yeah, very well laid out. I think sort of just this thing on this syllogism that McNally's using, uh, I think it's more of a rhetorical point rather, you know, the fact that it's a flawed syllogism is, I sort of think, the point of how he's using it. He's trying to imply that uh, this sort of ISO, or, or us, but, you know, especially the ISO, have this kind of uh, flawed logic, so it's an irrational sort of position, you know, trying to build these things. So that's what he's uh, trying to ascribe to it on that. So I think just attacking it for being a flawed syllogism is sort of missing the point of what he's doing there. Um, and as well, I think he sort of, I made this note for the comment I was going to make sort of before, when you're halfway through your thing and then you sort of uh, covered a bit of it. But uh, we do, you know, we do need to sort of uh, take on board these criticisms of, you know, the party building, you know, this kind of thing. And, you know, as you said, the, the risk of sectarianism is very real. Um, but I think we do have to properly engage with these kind of criticisms as well. So it isn't just enough to attack them and say why they're wrong. Uh, and I think, you know, you did do this. I think we, as an organisation and as the revolutionary left, don't do it enough. Uh, where, you know, you can take what's good from it, uh, because there is always some, you know, for anyone trying... For any you know, bourgeois economists or whatever, you know, the marginalists and all this, you can even learn things from these people, you know, let alone someone trying to work out revolutionary stuff. Uh, there is always, because they're always dealing with the same base reality, there's always something we can take from it, even if we have to discard a lot of uh, crap that builds up around it, you know. Um, where's the... Yeah, that's, that, that's it. Thanks, anyway. Cool. Mike is going to um, this comrade here. <clears throat> and after that, there's a comrade. Yeah, there's a comrade at the back here. Thanks. I, I had him down. Sorry, no, it was this guy, this guy here, sorry, with the cap, that's it. And then the comrade's a woman at the back there. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, also, uh, John, thank you for your talk. And um, I just wanted to... Wait a second. Uh, I just wanted uh, to say that uh, I'm from Germany, um, and in Germany we also have uh, very real um, experiences with that problems, because as maybe uh, a lot of you know, uh, we work within a, a mostly reformist organization which accepts revolutionaries or has where you have the ability to work within that. But of course, that leads to a lot of pressure being put on the um, on us uh, by the reformists that we uh, should streamline and uh, go, um, and that also then creates from the other side the pressure that to 
protect ourselves from that, we should be more uh, sectarian, but we also see where that can lead because we also have parts of the uh, uh, CW, uh, CWI and um, how, how sectarian they are working and what problems we have with them. Uh, exactly the same problems as uh, in Ireland. They officially are part of uh, this organization, but they don't really work with them and are always acting on their own. So the problems are, uh, are quite similar everywhere. Okay, great, thank you very much. So comrades, yeah, up there, followed by this comrade here, just on the right, thanks. Go. Yeah, my name is Christina, I'm also from Germany, um, and um, I'm working um, um, in Die Linke, I'm an MP for Die Linke, and I'm also um, supporting um, Marx 21. <clears throat> and I want to give you an idea about <clears throat> the situation, and I totally agree with um, with what um, John said in his in his talk, and then um, because um, even if you are not working separately as the, in a revolutionary organization, but you organize within um, a reformist party, it is so necessary. And I will give you three examples. It is important to prior uh, prior to, to to set priorities because um, if you are in a reformist party, you have different topics, different themes you can relate to, but um, to, to look which are the campaigns, which are the movements we want to build, we want to prioritize, you need, to, you need a party and this is done, um, you, you do this um, um, amongst um, like our comrades which share uh, um, an analysis of the current situation and the most important necessities. So we started a debate um, about the priority of fighting the AFD um, and, and confronting the AFD and building a strong movement against, um, and this is, this is one example. Secondly, um, the question of political intervention. Of course, if you have a reformist party, um, you need to intervene into political debates um, because um, there are different ideas um, coming up how to solve um, the problems. For example, we have now a debate about uh, climate justice and the question if we should have um, 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 taxes on, um, um, on, on fuels. And so we argue that we, we are against taxing like the working class. We need an anti-capitalist solution. So we have an intervention in the current debate. Um, and I can, I can give you thousands of examples, for example, on the question of Islamophobia and so on. Um, it needs um, a revolutionary um, organization to get clear about uh, the, political inter the, the, the topics of the political intervention. And of course, and I think this is the core question, um, um, the question of the political strategy. Um, in every movement, uh, every movement comes to a point where the question is how we should um, fulfill our demands. And is this by appealing um, to a government or, at the, or, or yourself going into government or is it by building um, the fights and the struggle and um, to, to, to fight, to, to have, a, have a revolutionary um, um, strategy. And I think um, to, to maintain this, to debate this and to have concrete um, um, proposals how, to, um, how to, to, to go forward in a certain situation, you need to have a, um, a revolution revolutionary organization, which changes in its form. So it's a caricature if you, um, what, what McNally um, writes about um, the, the propaganda routine. This is not what we are Some doing, are uh, we, um, but it's important to maintain um, um, an independent structure to, to have a, a debate, to also to, to educate Some people up, please, um, 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 to, um, yeah, to really um, change um, and to really intervene into a broader movement or into, into a reformist party. Great, thank you very much. Um, so comrades just down here and then there's a comrade in the back in black t-shirt and glasses thanks hello I'm um, from Wigan um, I was in a bit of a struggle about six years ago uh, the Wigan Hobbies um, site we were on strike uh, we went on strike for two weeks and to, to start the story I, I'm not, not bore you with all the, the details about it but for the first day we were all it was about 50 of us on the picket line and we were all sort of new to it, a bit apprehensive about standing there. We had the managers goading us because they do nothing for 24 hours per bar. So um, within two weeks, we had them scurrying away. But what I'm saying is in them positions, uh, it felt like a revolution. It felt like the people who I was working with, because 
prior to the strike, everybody was going to work, got the blinkers on, you know, I'm dealing with my life. But as soon as we went on strike, we had more time to discuss things on the picket line. Uh, barriers got broken down, um, and then we had the, the usual people that came to support us, and the, the SWP were there, they came, and that's when I joined. I joined through that struggle. Um, but what I'm saying is, as, as the, the strike went on, people were, people were stepping up to do roles. We had, um, we had like a 24-hour picket. So basically what people were doing, uh, if you were on days, you were there in the daytime. If you were on the night, because it's like a 24-hour, seven days a week working system. So we, we organized that between us. We didn't, need, um, we didn't need anybody else. We just had little groups of people decided. We had a phone on the picket line uh, where we could um, discuss things, what was happening. So say, for instance, if I was on nights, I finished at 6 o'clock at night, I could phone up at 10 o'clock at, at night because um, because of what was happening, it was sort of hard to sleep because you wanted to get back on the picket line. It was it was fantastic. So you could just ring up and say, well, what's happening? And you'd get some... And we'd say, sorry, this could take forever. <laughs> no, you, you've only got one minute, I promise, I promise you. <laughs> uh, so uh, when, when I went back to work, to cut a long story short, um, people were, were sort of like goading me because I joined the SWP. And at the time, it was um, the um, political... Um, um, like a, it was about UKIP and Labour and, in the general election. And a lot of people were going to me about UKIP. They say, why should we deal with Labour? I'm going to join UKIP, giving me that. And then within the day before the election, people were coming to me to say, why, you know, giving, because I was giving the argument about UKIP all the time. And they were, they were saying to me, I'm going to be, I'm going to be voted for Labour because what had happened is, because I educated myself, known the facts, could have the argument with the working people on the shop floor. That's it, mate. So that was the paper that helped me do that. So I, I recommend that you join the SWP. <laughs> Fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have the comrade now in the black t-shirt back. Just in front of that comrade is a comrade of Red Lanyard. Uh, you'll be there after, next after that, thanks. Yeah, I think that is a perfect example of our current situation. The relationship between party and class and the arguments carried by individuals, but also by a paper. Because through that means, if you like, the, the, the learning from the class, the experience of the class, which in Britain at the moment, we haven't got a high level of class struggle. So these moments of class struggle are precious things. And if, because we have a party organized around a series of principles, the key, which I agree with Sheila, is that it, the revolution is the act of the working class. You have to be ready to relate to the working class at whatever level it is and wherever the struggle breaks out. And to do that with a paper, I think, is key because that's how people identify with the politics. That, and that's worked. That's a concrete example of how that's worked. And there's many. We're not recruiting nearly as many people as we should be. But the, you can see the dangers of some of these formulations that David McNeil is coming out with when you relate to movements, because movements are not strikes. In a movement, on whether it be climate change, whether it be women's rights or whatever, there is a wide variety of political opinion. Some of it actually very right-wing and reactionary, all united under a banner. And it does seem to be great. You're marching with thousands of people. It's the same in the independence movement at the moment in Scotland. Who are the people who are going to carry the revolutionary politics that says, actually, I don't agree with that, I think we should be doing this? And all the time relating it back to what is in the interest of the working class and building the working class movement. How do you guarantee that there's a group of people doing that if you cannot then relate back, given all the pressures that people have identified, the strong person of politics, the figure, if you think about Trump, Trump has attracted working class people because he didn't see an alternative based on their politics and their interest. Where do you get the strength, the education, as this comrade in front of me talked about? Where, where's the mechanism for educating people in the politics that puts the working class at the centre if you don't have a, an organised party identified through literature? 
with, I think, socialist work, it plays that role very well at the moment. And without it, you wonder, well, how would we relate to these movements without that paper to sell at them, without that banner to fly? So I think, you know, let's go back to Tony Cliff, let's go back to party and class and tell people this is why we say what we say. This is why we are not sectarian, because we have a mechanism in which a group of people can relate to the class and the movements, but also bring that experience back, and then you talk about it and adapt. There's many different ways to organize revolutionaries, but ultimately it's still a group of people organized around a set of politics at which the working class is the key. Right, thank you very much. Just in front of you, and then after you, Comrade, if you could just pass it down to the woman, Comrade, sort of to your left, this, like, this woman here, great, thank you, afterwards, thanks. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, I mean, right now, sorry, I came a bit late, so you may have said this, but it's like a really, uh, there's a worrying trend on like the Twitter left and like YouTube and stuff of like left communism, like, you know, they're starting to make a really major comeback, the kind of critique of party building, all this kind of thing. Um, and one of the things they say is uh, the party's a 20th century relic. You know, we don't need it anymore. And first of all, I'd like to say, when it comes to revolution, I don't know how you're going to partake in it from your armchair. You know, you need to actually get up and get, take part in the struggles, don't you? Um, but and obviously what we're saying as well, we're not emulating the Bolsheviks like word for word. Um, we are, we're taking the principles of that and we're carrying them forward. Um, so say one of the most, um, I think one of the most fundamental is democratic centralism. Um, it is absolutely crucial to the party. It comes from the, the history of the class, you know, from the strike committees, all this kind of thing where you have the debates, you bust each other up, and then you have the vote, and after that, you're all unified after that, you know. You're all fighting together, you're all in the same fight. Because if you divide yourselves up like in Labour, um, you know, where you have all these different kind of factions, you will lose, you know. You divide yourselves up, and when you divide it, you fall, don't you, at the end of the day? Um, and obviously, an, another amazing thing about the Revolutionary Party is just how engaged in the movement you actually are as well. Um, I think it was George Osborne that said, oh, all these protests, you know, you always see the bloody socialist worker there. And I think that's a compliment at the end of the day because we're in every single struggle, we're on all the marches, all the strikes, we're on every picket line, we're always there sending our paper, getting our, our ideas out there. Because it's such a polarized society, you need a new alternative vision. And that alternative vision is socialism. And the, and the party is the hammer of our class when it comes to it at the end of the day. It's one of our strongest weapons. So with that, I would say, if you share our vision, you should join the SWP today and you're one of the best decisions of your life. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, comrade there. And then after you, there's a comrade in the uh, lilac t-shirt over here after that. Um, I've got two questions. Thanks, John. That was a really, really interesting talk. My first question is about theory. I know Dave McNally loves theory because I've tried to read his critique of intersectionality theory, which is based on his exposition of Newtonian physics. And I personally found quite a challenge. This is, believe me, it's, it's quite complicated. This seems to me a travesty of revolutionary theory because it's divorced from revolutionary practice. And revolutionary theory should not be about sinecures in academia, although obviously for some people that's necessary. It should not be about showing off and using the most dense and complicated language in your desperate search to pinpoint one bit of originality. It should be about strengthening and informing practice and the revolutionary party is in some ways the embodiment isn't it of revolutionary practice in the past theorized and I was really sad when the ISO in America collapsed because for all the ins and outs of which I know very little the idea there would be no revolutionary party in America I thought was really sad because of course there'll be transformational struggles and there'll be all kinds of amazing people and ideas will be thrown up but the experience of 1917 will not be there and the experience of Germany 1919 will not be there. And all these revolutions that inform our, you know, the, the revolutionary tradition will not be there. And how do they become rebuilt then, is my question. How do you start again in America or from scratch in Sudan? Sorry, and the second question very quickly is about sectarianism. Because nobody, you know, no young idealistic 20-year-old joins a revolutionary party to become a miserable, bitter, cynical, <laughs> grumpy you know, down in the dumps, old, but, but people do, sadly. Nobody starts, <laughs> speaking personally, but, but people do because they have the wrong understanding or they have bad politics or whatever. Rosa Luxemburg said it was inherent in the process of revolutionary party building, the, the inherent struggle between opportunism and sectarianism. You would never permanently defeat them. They would always be there. So how does a revolutionary party like the Socialist Workers' Party 
guarantee or attempt to guarantee that you do not lapse either into opportunism and thinking, thank God we've got friends at last, let's go down this path, we can get more friends, or sectarianism where you have to close yourself off and protect yourself from the cold, hard world. Thanks, Jo. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so there's a comrade here, yep, in the like, top, and then after that there's a guy here with a black T-shirt. Thank you. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> Do you want me to move on to somebody else? No, no, I just want to say something about practice. <laughs> very sim- no, it's very brief. It's all, I, all I wanted to say was, John talked about tradition, but there's, the thing is, there is that tradition out there, and that's very important, but there's an, a side of tradition that I just re- recall from so many meetings years ago, and that was the memory of the class, the idea of the memory. And the living memory of the class is what Judith was talking about, is this notion of, uh, and other speakers have have talked about, is this notion of how you work as an activist in in wherever you're working. How do you relate your ideas? And you have to relate your ideas to the collective political current that fights for the left. And that's what's so important about my experiences when I was a youngster. When I joined the party at the time of the rank and file movements, what was going on there, how you, how you developed yourself politically and how people developed around you, and how you, the, the, the comment of the comrade at the back about the importance of, of a revolutionary newspaper that puts those ideas out front. And that's the living process. And you won't get that in any kind of talking shop. And the point about McNally is I didn't join uh, because I thought that the point was not to change the world but only to interpret it. The point is that we, we, we join because we believe we're going to change the world. And that's, that's the point I wanted to make. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> comrade, comrade just um, there with the black T-shirt in the middle of that, that row there. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then the guy with the red T-shirt who's doing the mic, and then that will be the all I've got time for. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone, for the thoughtful contributions. My question is about party building in minor, in minor and micro states. Uh, my partner and I are Guyanese, small country of under 800,000 people. And the particular question is, what does party building look like um, in, in these small countries, particularly when the diaspora, which is either created through immigration or through large um, refugee waves, and it's, it's not just a country like Guyana. There's cities like London, Berlin, Toronto, where we're visiting from, have huge diasporic communities where people in them quite often have a foot in both worlds. So my question is, what do uh, groups like the SWP and others in the ISD tendency, what role can they play in organizing both where people land and aiding in the, t- in the question of party building in the countries where these communities are originally from? Because I don't think it's divorced. And I based on my experience in the Guyanese uh, community in, in Toronto and, and in Guyana, it's uh, in the Caribbean, there's a, there's a moment happening right now. And I don't think it's isolated to there, in the English-speaking Caribbean, uh, so the West Indies. So in, in Trinidad and Tobago, the largest party for reform there, the People's National Movement, uh, of which T.L.R. James supported, they led the country to independence, just put through the largest, um, the largest series of cuts in, in the nation's history. They attacked the oil workers trade union, the second largest and one of the most politically clear and militant unions in the West Indies. That was done by people who identify as socialists. And there are good socialists, people who have just joined the party their parents joined, who see themselves as socialists and see themselves as closer to these politics than there. In Barbados, socialists dissolved into the Barbados Labour Party, which won every seat in parliament last year. And they are completely hamstrung. Socialists are frustrated there. And the same in Guyana, same cuts. So uh, again, uh, what role do groups like the SWP and those in our tradition play in organizing uh, and facilitating party building both here and uh, where diasporic and refugee communities originate? Thank you, thank you. Okay, this guy and then yeah. Look, I can't overemphasize how important the arguments that John has put forward are. I think if you look at what happened since the crisis broke out uh, 10 years ago now, there is a fact, which is that there have been huge opportunities for the left, huge potential, but arguably uh, not a single one of the big Leninist organizations that exist in the world have managed to navigate this period without going into a crisis of one way or of, of another. And most times, uh, you know, questions of how to relate to the new left reformist uh, you know, mass parties and the relevance of, of, of revolutionary organization have been at the heart of this. 
Time, I think, clarifies many of these things and these debates. Um, you look at Spain, five years ago, when Podemos, the left party, was set up, there was huge pressure on the revolutionary left. And most people on the revolutionary left argued that it, you know, the space for an independent revolutionary party didn't exist anymore, and what people had to do was to go into Podemos and become part of, of, of that. Uh, today, Podemos is begging the Socialist Party, who, which five years ago they had vowed to um, overthrow and overtake and so on, they're begging them for a ministry. Um, there's no independent force that can put forward working class demands in the Spanish state. You look at Greece, uh, Syriza, our comrades in Greece, in SEC, uh, were under huge pressure as well. Uh, they were accused of sectarianism because they, you know, they, they built the anti-capitalist coalition and Antasia. Um, today, our comrades from Greece are not here at Marxism, unfortunately, because tomorrow uh, there will be a general election in Greece where unfortunately the Syriza government, hope of Europe, is uh, due very likely, I regret to say, to lose the election. John spoke about Sudan. Uh, people may not have seen uh, that yesterday the leaders of the opposition and the military struck a sell-out deal uh, that is going to give the military uh, unless this is stopped, uh, 22 months of military uh, rule. And, you know, that points again to the importance of what John said. What a difference a revolutionary organization in Sudan could have made um, if it existed, as small as it could have been. Um, the question, of course, is, you know, all, all these shortcuts can be very tempting sometimes, and at times they can look like the way forward for the left. Um, but in the long run, you see that there's no alternative to build a revolutionary organization committed to overthrowing capitalism. The key, though, is what John said, uh, how to relate to this mood that exists today and the potential that everybody can see. Great. Thank you, John. If you'd like to uh, sum up, thank you very much. Uh, thank, you, thank you, everybody, for the discussion. Um, I start with uh, something that Sheila McGregor said from the back when she said, if you look at our history, she said, we made all these mistakes. And there were several questions which... Um, asked like how do you ensure that all the members become fully developed communists and another question i think from judy judy cox up there how do you guarantee you don't fall into opportunism on the one hand and sectarianism on the other um, the answer i would give to all of these is there are absolutely no guarantees rather i would suggest the the only guarantee is, I would offer is that at some point you will make all those mistakes in the future. You will fall sometimes into opportunism, sometimes into sectarianism. You won't succeed in developing everybody into a fully developed revolutionary communist if any of us are such a thing, uh, and so on. That's life, uh, and that's central to, to, to uh, my argument in this. Uh, I think that one should not imagine one should not imagine in the first place that the Bolshevik party avoided all such mistakes. Not a bit of it. There's a kind of version in which, of, of history in which uh, occasionally the Bolshevik party made mistakes. They were immediately put right by Lenin, who was always right. Um, and they never got things wrong. Actually, when you, when you break from that mindset, you find it wasn't like that at all. Uh, they, went, they were severely ultra-left for a while after the... Uh, uh, say, defeat of the 1905 revolution. Uh, Lenin included. Then Lenin was quicker than others at seeing he was wrong. Then he had to break party discipline and voted with the Mensheviks. In 1917, they were opportunist uh, in the early phase of the, uh, immediately after the fall of, uh, of the Tsar. And that was okay, certainly Lenin was important in correcting that at the time of the April conference. But Lenin got the organization of the October insurrection wrong, and fortunately Trotsky was better at it. And so it is not like that and never, uh, uh, will, uh, never will be. What you all that you could hope to do is to avoid being completely shipwrecked by the mistakes that you make and that you could hopefully correct the course and get back on course and the interaction with the class is, uh, uh, and being disciplined by the movement is absolutely uh, uh, crucial, crucial uh, uh, to, to that that whole process. Um, the comrade who said about uh, uh, being a bit nice, learning from McNally and being a bit nicer to him, um, it was funny really, because I, in the article, and even 
was speaking. I thought I bent over backwards not to be too nasty to David McNally, but there you, uh, there you go. Um, right. Uh, the the uh, I think it's interesting when you listen to different people speaking from different countries, how often you find that the same problems exist but in different contexts and sometimes different problems. But uh, So I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all. I was listening to what was being said uh, uh, by the, the German comrades. It was very interesting. Um, for example, you talked about in response to the climate crisis how... Uh, the, 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 what we would in Ireland would call carbon taxes are being introduced. You know, the way in which the ruling class is trying to respond to this by taxing ordinary people. We have exactly the same issue uh, uh, in Ireland. We have to fight over that without cutting ourselves off from the environmental movement. You know, how you put that argument, how you deal with that argument. Very important. So very similar, but a very different situation in the sense of you're operating inside De Linke, which I think is correct in Germany insofar as I uh, 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 understand the situation. Operating inside a broader reformist tendency or a broader reformist party is not something that is completely outside our tradition. The IS, the Socialist Review Group that preceded the SWP, did this inside the Labour Party for a period. It's not an absolute principle that you don't do it. And so I think the German comrades are right to do it. It's very different from our situation in Ireland. We're not operating, you couldn't. Uh, and that, it would be mad to try and operate inside the Irish Labour Party. That would be, uh, people would need to know the particular history. That would, uh, we, we would be immediately rejected by the mass of the working class. It wouldn't put us in touch with working class. But we're not operating inside a, uh, a broader reformist party, operating inside people before profit. Uh, people before profit is under the political hegemony of the Socialist Workers Network and so on. It's a, a different situation. So the problem here is to how to apply the fundamental principles in different circumstances, learning as you're going, uh, going on uh, and developing. A couple of other points that I think are, are, are important. Um, the argument about uh, relating to the working class and the self-emancipation of the working class. That is the most fundamental principle. But who the working class are is something that is shifting, and I think that's very important. I think it's important that we understand the working class are not simply the old industrial workers. That many people who are now part of the working class and crucial for the working class movement are people who often people think of as uh, middle class. Uh, and, uh, okay, so I think that's an important point. I tried to address this in an article I wrote uh, uh, in the previous issue of uh, Irish Marxist Review called uh, What is the Future for Marxism? I think that's an uh, 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 important point. Uh, there were questions that I can't answer, unfortunately, because I just don't think I'm in a position. The contribution from the Guyanese comrade is extremely interesting. But one th idea we have to get away from is the idea that, because you've written a book on the subject or something in... London, that you can answer, I can't answer your questions of how to build in uh, Guyana. I'll talk to you about it. I mean, it's really interesting, but I'm going to stand here and tell you what you should do when I know nothing about it. But I, I think that what's important is uh, uh, that it's, a, it's not an easy thing to form a new organization starting from scratch in Sudan or in America or, or, or anywhere else. But you try. I think is the answer. You find how you're addressing the problem of how to do it because it, uh, because it is uh, uh, so necessary. Um, the question uh, that I didn't really have a chance to get into because there's always so, so much to say on these things. Uh, the question of how we relate to left reformism seems to me to be an enormously important question internationally. Right, whether it takes the form of Podemos or it takes the form of Sanders uh, and the Democratic Socialists of America or it takes uh, the form of Momentum uh, and the Corbynistas in, uh, uh, in Britain, all sorts of different forms that it takes. I think that is of huge importance uh, in, the, uh, in the present period. The immediate reaction of people when they radicalize and there have been waves of radicalization across the world from mainstream politics is to left reformism, not immediately to full-blown revolutionary socialism. So how do we relate to those people and, uh, and win them over? I haven't got time to discuss all those issues. But again, I do not think 
it's simply one size fits all. One of the purposes of people before profit in Ireland has worked that way was to create a frame of organization through which people could transition from an angry left reformism against the government to revolutionary politics. And it has worked pretty well in, in doing that. If I think it was a fundamental problem in America that led to the dissolution of the ISO that they were so obsessed with purity that they didn't relate and couldn't relate to the, the Sanders movement, to, to the Democratic Socialists of America and so on. If I'd been in the ISO, I'd have been arguing for finding, very strongly for finding ways of relating to, uh, to those people. I don't see that as compromising revolution. I see that as essential for, for building uh, a, 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 a revolutionary party. And I'll come back to uh, the point that uh, uh, Hector made at the end about the situation in Sudan. The situation in Sudan is contradictory. And how we relate to it is, I think it's crucial to what we're doing in the, in the world. You have a magnificent movement that arises. A movement, though, with all sorts, actually, to be honest, with all sorts of illusions, under the leadership of uh, bourgeois nationalists and bourgeois democrats and the Sudanese Communist Party. We find ourselves in Dublin relating to the Sudanese Communist Party and talking to them, and they're very friendly and open to us. And they're not pro-Russian Stalinists because they know that Russia has sold them out, and China has sold them out, and so on. But they are deeply committed to one of the worst forms of stages theory, to a belief that all you do is talk about a, a civilian rule at the moment. You don't raise economic demands, and a very, very limited form of that. So how we relate to them? We have to be open. We don't start with where we disagree. We start with where we agree, solidarity and so on, but how you develop that movement. Those sort of problems which come again and again, you can only solve those problems if you have a revolutionary organization to start from. If you do it as individuals, you'll never find a way of developing those things. So it's necessary in Sudan, but it's also necessary for our work here now that you start from a revolutionary organization that develops, as was said several times in the meeting, that is able to strategize, to build the links from the struggle today to the revolution of the future. Both ends of which, the struggle today and the revolution of the future, have to be linked. It is the job of the Revolutionary Party to secure that, to fight, as Marx said, for the long-term interests of the working class in the movement today. You can only do that by building revolutionary organization.